the supercomputer being built by a friend of the pod, Elon. He's now got the world's largest supercomputer, and he's going to 10x it, according to reports. Yeah, and I would just say this is, I think, a very important moment for AI, you know, for this entire AI trade in public and private markets. You know, everybody, I'm sure, who watches your podcast is very aware of scaling loss. And we have not had a scaling loss for training, or if you 10x the amount of compute used to train a model, you significantly improve the intelligence and capability of that model. And often there are these, um, you know, kind of emergent properties that emerge alongside that, that higher IQ. No one thought it was possible to make more than 25,000, maybe 30,000, 32,000, pick a number, NVIDIA hoppers coherent. And what coherent means is in a training cluster that each GPU, to kind of simplify it, knows what every other GPU is thinking. So every GPU in that 30,000 cluster knows what the other 29,999 are thinking. And you need a lot of networking to make that happen. Enabled by InfiniBand, right? Uh, InfiniBand, and, and I think even more importantly, NVLink. Although a lot of e Ethernet is, um, you know, never bet against the internet, never, never bet against Ethernet. Um, like if you read the Llama 3.1 technical paper, you know, got a lot of people excited about skinny link Ethernet. But um, just to nope. slow down for the audience here, Gavin, maybe Sorry. explain why transporting information between the GPUs is important. And we're talking, we get, we're in the weeds here a little bit. Everybody's heard of Ethernet, but some of the other protocols uh, and ways of moving stuff around large amounts of data. That's what these H200s, H100s do particularly well. They'll move a couple of terabytes a second from one processor to the next processor. Yeah. So, um, you know, picture a server in the case of a GPU. It looks like maybe three pizza boxes stacked on top of each other, and it has eight GPUs together. And those eight GPUs are connected today with something called NVLink. Broadly, you can think of the speed of communication. On chip is the fastest. Chip to memory, next fastest. You know, um, chip to chip within a server, next fastest. And so you take those units of servers, which are connected, the GPUs are connected on the server with a technology called NVSwitch, and you stitch them together with either InfiniBand or Ethernet into a giant cluster. And each GPU has to be connected to every other GPU and know what they're thinking. They need to be coherent. They need to kind of share memory. For the compute to work, the GPUs need to work together for AI. And no one thought it was possible to connect more than 30,000 of these with today's technology. From public reports, Elon, as he so often does, focused deeply on this, thought about it from first principles, how long it should take, the way it should be done. And he came up with a very, very different way of designing a data center. And he was able to make over 100,000 GPUs coherent. No one thought it was possible. Hmm. If uh, I was I was a last minute ad for this, but I would have said there were all these articles that were being published in the summer hmm. saying that no one believed he was going to be able to do it. It was hype. It was, you know, ridiculousness. And that was coming. The reason the reporters felt comfortable writing those silly stories is because engineers at Meta and Google and other firms were saying, we can't do it. There's no way he can do it. Hmm. He did it. And I think the world really only believed it when, you know, Jensen did that podcast, I think, with, uh, wasn't it with Gerstner? It might have been with Gerstner. Yeah, I think it was with Gerstner and said um, what Elon did was superhuman. No one else could have done it. And I actually think you can argue that Elon doing that in a lot of ways kind of saved NVIDIA from a tough six month period when Blackwell was delayed. Because everyone who was waiting for Blackwell and thought it was impossible to make 100,000 hoppers coherent rushed out and bought a lot of hoppers to try and do it themselves. Now, hmm. we will see if someone else is able to do it. It was really, really hard. 
no one else thought it was possible. And, and as a result of that, Grok 3 is in trading now on this giant Colossus supercomputer, the biggest in the world, 100,000 GPUs. Memphis. In, in Memphis. Memphis. In at Memphis. the old Electrolux factory. And they're, they're putting a lot of energy in there, a lot of natural gas, a lot of... Yeah, a dingy Electrolux factory. Yeah. yeah. With a lot of mega packs around it. And the city of Memphis is all in on supporting this. Yeah. Which is obviously smart for them. But you have not had a real test of scaling laws for training, arguably since GPT-4. And this will be the first test. And if scaling laws for training hold, Grok-3 should be a significant advance in the state of the art. That is an immensely, you know, from like a Bayesian way to look at the world, that is like an immensely important data point. But it, if that card doesn't work, and I think it is going to work, I think Grok-3 is going to be really good. I should note that I what am. What would my, consumers, my, yeah, you're, you're involved. My firm in is an XAI. investor in XAI. Got it. Yeah, they, they've raised a tremendous amount of capital, a lot of it from the Middle East, and they're supposedly going to build Colossus to a million GPUs. Is this data goal 10 times bigger than it is currently? There's been some debate back and forth, Freeberg, about, hey, are we hitting a wall here? Maybe you could explain the wall, either of you, to the audience. Yeah, David? Well, I'll, I'll let Gavin speak to the wall. I, I mean, Gavin, I think one of the questions also is, you know, do we see an evolution if if the kind of increment in performance relative to the investment in net kind of training compute resources declines, do we start to see a shift in um, how the architecture of the systems are run? Meaning, like, do we start to build models of models and that starts to resolve a higher level architecture that unlocks new performative capabilities so i would just say we're already building models of models you know almost every application startup i'm aware of is chaining models you know you start yeah. with a cheap model you check the cheap models work with a more expensive model you know lots of very clever things are being done you know every every ai application company has what's called a router so they can you know swap out the underlying model if another one is better for the task at hand um as far as what the wall is, there's been a big debate that we were hitting a wall on these scaling laws and that scaling laws were breaking down. And I just thought that was deeply silly because no one had built a cluster bigger than, you know, 32,000 H100s <laughs> and nobody knew. It was, uh, it was a ridiculous debate. And there were, you know, really smart people on both sides, but there is, there, there's no new data. Grok 3 is the first new data point to support whether or not scaling laws are breaking or holding because no one else thought you could make 100,000 hoppers coherent. And I think based on public reports, they're going to 200,000 um, hoppers. And then the next tick is a million. It was reported they're going to be first in line for Blackwell. But Grok 3 is a big card and will resolve this question of whether or not we're hitting a wall. The other question you raise. David, it's very interesting. And by the way, we should note there is now a new axis of scaling. Some people call it test time compute. Some people call it inference scaling. And basically the way this works, you just think of these models as human. The more you speak to one of these models, the way you'd speak to your like 17-year-old going off to take the SAT, the better it will do for you. As a human, you know, if I ask you, David, what's two plus two, four flashes in your mind right away. If I ask you to, you know, unify a grand unified theory of physics that accounts for both quantum mechanics and relativistic physics, you will think for a lot longer. We have been, yeah, yeah, nobody knows. We have been giving these models the same amount of time to think, no matter how complicated the question was. What we've now learned is if you let them think for longer about more complex questions, test time compute, you can dramatically improve their IQ. So we're just at the beginning of this new scaling law. But I think the question you raise on ROI is very good. And I'm happy to and address it. And, and, and there's a context window oh, yeah, shift yeah. underway as well, which also creates a new kind of scaling access, arguably, in terms Massive. of the potential set of applications. So networks of models, think time, context window. There are multiple dimensions upon which these, these tools ultimately kind of resolve to better performance Oh, yeah, we have, Without, even yeah. if scaling laws for training break, 
We have another exactly. decade of innovation ahead of us. Exactly. And 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 as my understanding from speaking to folks, I'm certainly not as deep and, and well versed as you, but there's a lot of effort and research going on in re-engineering various parts of the uh, the stack to reduce energy, to reduce every resource that effectively drives model performance, to basically re-engineer architecture. It was all like very brute force for a period of time. And it was like push, push, push. But now as we go back and we start to re-engineer and architect things in perhaps a more designed way, we get better performance. And there's a lot of work to do there still.